We're back with another episode of the Randy Wilson Podcast. This is episode 97, and we are live again today here at Spin 100 FM, the new home of hip-hop and R&B for the state of Virginia. And I uh, have a very exciting guest today with us, Miss Greta Harris. For episode 97, she's a little upset with me because we didn't hit the century mark with her today, but um, it's my goal that she becomes a staple on our show because um, she's a staple in our community. And when it comes to housing, she is the person that I strongly believe is uh, one of the folks in the city, if not the, the primary person in the city that I'm going to, and I, I want education and knowledge. And so we're really happy to have her on the show. But before we get into this interview, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. This podcast can be found everywhere podcasts are played, okay? But I strongly suggest you to go over to YouTube because then you're going to get a chance to see the beautiful lady today, Miss Greta Harris. Thank you, Miss Harris, for coming on the show. Thanks, Randy. Happy to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. It's, um, we were talking about this, I think, a couple of months ago, and... Uh, tried to get you as close to 100 as possible, <laughs> but you're here. I'm not mad at you. It's all good. This is, this, this is, a, this is a big show. This is, this is a really big show. Before the interview, we were talking about, you know, she's seen my, my notes here, and, you know, I'm from North Carolina, as, as I believe you're aware, and so I don't think that when it comes to Richmond, our region, and particularly when it comes to housing, not many people are a stranger to knowing like Miss Greta Harris. You have a, your name is pretty well recognized. And before I ever got a chance to meet you in person, mm -hmm. I was familiar with you and all the great work that you've done. But for some of my following who may not be familiar, particularly those down in North Carolina, I want to give them a little bit of a background on who you are. Okay. 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 Um, CEO and president of Better Housing Coalition. And I believe you've been in that position in that seat since 2013. Yes. Um, Man, she she serves on quite a few committees. And before the interview, I was I was telling Miss Harris, I was asking her like, do you ever get tired of hearing these things? Um, I I know that she's humbled and I know that she's appreciative, but I want you guys to know. I want you to become familiar with the great things that she she's got going on and that she's accomplished. She just recently joined the Greater Washington Partnership as a board member. Yes. And I'm and I'm gonna want to talk about that with you. Uh, Virginia Tech University Board of Visitors, mm -hmm. uh, Chamber RVA Board Member, yes. uh, Partnership for Housing uh, Affordability, Affordability. Mm -hmm. yes. Housing Partnership Network, yes. Richmond Jazz Society. Absolutely. So we're going to, and this is a, we, uh, a lot of my following is music lovers, so we're going to definitely talk a little music with you. Okay. Um, 95 grad of LMR. And in 2021, you were recognized uh, by LMR, if I'm correct. Is it with a was it the UCROP Visionary Visionary Award? Mm -hmm. uh, visionary is definitely you've definitely been a visionary for our community. National Neighbor Neighborhood Association 2021 Practitioner of the Year. Mm -hmm. You guys get the point. I could keep going. I could keep going. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna relax. I'm gonna relax because I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to <laughs> I don't I don't want her sweating over here. But man, it is it's uh it's impressive. You are um, we are in Black History Month, mm -hmm. and I believe that one of the reasons why this interview is special to me, particularly in Black History Month, mm -hmm. is because I believe that students in our in in our school system today and for years to come need to be familiar with other black leaders in our community and the work that they've done. And I strongly believe that you will be, if, and should be currently, one of those people that our community and our students should be looking at because you, you've trailblazed for us. And, and I just want to show my appreciation uh, for you. And, and, and not only for you, but from, from the community. Um, we look at you in very high regard. Um, I, was, I was able to have Ms. Greta Harris come speak to uh, my board of directors at home again on behalf of housing and they was blown away uh just with the knowledge and it's you know the knowledge that you have but also the way the, the ability that you have to deliver and convey things and so i appreciate you i really do thank you randy i appreciate you too so 
We're glad to have you on the show. I don't know how, how familiar are you with the show? Because we asked some interesting questions around here, you know. Um, I did uh, my homework. <laughs> I, I rarely show up someplace without doing a little bit of investigation. Mm -hmm. So I've watched a, a few of your shows and all. And the questions do go in some interesting directions. So I'm ready. <laughs> you know, you can fire away. Got you. Got you. Um, I want to get right into housing. Okay. I do. I want to get right into housing. Um, and I want to talk about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, you know, we are, I guess they're closing up. Session's coming to an end here soon, isn't it? About another month. Yeah. About at the midway point. Yeah. Are, are there any things particularly that you have been uh, lobbying or advocating for uh, with our legislators in this General Assembly session? Yeah. Um, so the previous administration, uh, the Northam administration, uh, proposed in the biennial budget uh, the largest amount of uh, resources to go into the state housing trust fund. Um, and because of the results of the November 2021 election, um, there were some changes in leadership and we aren't as confident that we'll be able to protect that proposed investment. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost of housing is escalating from labor price, uh, material pricing, uh, land costs, regulatory costs, uh, supply chain issues, and all of that makes it much more difficult to deliver a quality product at an affordable price. And so having public sector um, resources at scale available um, can offset those rising costs. So um, when you're doing especially state lobbying work or advocacy work, um, numbers matter. So we belong to the Virginia Housing Alliance and that has representatives all over the Commonwealth. And so we have Housing Day coming up uh, the latter part of next week. And so we've been having conversations with our representatives it's a question mark whether or not, even though the state is flush with money, um, uh, you're gonna people are voting with their values, and so I'm not a hundred percent sure where uh, the budget's gonna land. But that's our biggest uh, legislative item this year. Um, when you're walking down these halls, mm -hmm. and you obviously have to work on both the right side and the left side. Absolutely, we're right down the middle. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that though? Like, because we've had a change in leadership. We have a, uh, Glenn Youngkin is our new governor. He's a Republican governor. Um, I don't know if I get the impression that he's, I don't know if there's any such thing as a normal politician, but I don't know if he's like, he's a different type of Republican. I mean, he's a different type. He's gonna be a different type of governor, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so like, when, you work, when you're walking down these halls, what do you see different on both sides? You have to walk the middle, mm -hmm. but, but is there anything that you see different? Because there's been a change in the leadership, uh, do you anticipate there being, what are the changes you can anticipate from the different parties? So, so I think when you're advocating for whatever issue, um, the most important thing to do is to stay true to who you are and, and what's important to you. And the older I get, um, the more I realize I, I don't have the bandwidth to tell you one thing on one side of the aisle and tell somebody else something differently on the other side of the aisle. So what I'm saying, I, I say to everyone, uh, it will be received in different ways depending on one's perspective and one's beliefs. But um, I think housing is, uh, is not a partisan issue. Uh, everyone needs safe shelter, and really the last couple of years have helped to elevate that awareness that it doesn't matter if you're white, you're black, you're poor, you're rich, everyone needs safe shelter. And so um, I think across the country, everyone's acknowledging that the cost of housing, even if you're a middle income or upper income person, the cost of housing is rising much faster than um, the wages are rising. And so there's a growing chasm between um, people having good choice as to where and how they live. 
So when we're at the General Assembly or when we're up on the Hill in Washington or going into City Hall, the message is the same that we have to work together and there are finite resources to get this work done. And so the more we can align the limited resources we have, whether it's from philanthropy, public sector, private sector, that's where we get a leverage factor in order to be more proactive um, in trying to make people's lives a little bit better by having a good place to call home. What do you think that for the 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 average Richmonder, you know, working class person who's not, you know, as probably knowledgeable as let's say you or I because they haven't worked in housing, mm -hmm. right? Um, what do you think are some of the things that people just don't realize that are current barriers or challenges within the community when we talk about affordable housing? Mm -hmm. I think it's the perception issue of, of who's being served when we um, do a, a real estate transaction. I think over the last few years, and I've been doing this for over 30 years now, mm -hmm. there is greater awareness that everyone needs safe shelter. And, and there is greater agreement that people uh, think that affordable housing is a good thing and a needed thing until it comes into your neighborhood. Mm, yeah. And then uh, the NIMBY, not in my backyard, phenomenon is, is real. Um, we are about to break ground and I'm so excited in about three weeks on a $20 million investment in Jackson Ward. We've been working on this. Deal. How much? How much? Twenty million. There you go. Congratulations. Yeah, that's a smaller deal for us. Oh. We have a much bigger deal. I just like to see you yeah. stun. I want to see you stun a little bit. I just want you to stun a little bit. And um, we had been working on this deal for a long period of time, and and once uh, we had to, we like to engage with the community and and have them see this as an asset mm -hmm. for for the neighborhood but we rarely have people that say they want what we do. Mm -hmm. And so there was some pushback and we were having a community meeting and it was getting pretty contentious. Yeah. And the statement was made by a resident, we love affordable housing. We just don't want it here, which is the quintessential yeah. definition of NIMBY. So uh, thankfully, we, we were able to work it through because we needed a council vote uh, to be able to get over that regulatory hurdle. And we got the vote, even though the council person for the community voted against it. Um, but we're gonna bring 67 quality serviced enriched um, apartments to the community that is rapidly becoming so expensive that everyday people um, who, you know, I just went downstairs and, and bought coffee, the folks who are serving you your coffee, the folks who are serving you great foods and all these wonderful restaurants in the RVA region, uh, the folks who are taking care of your kids, the folks who are helping you take care of your elderly parents, the folks who are cutting the grass. I mean, those are the folks who live in our community in addition to teachers, We've had police officers, we've had firefighters, EMTs. Um, and when people say, well, who needs affordable housing? Well, we all do. I don't care if you're a multimillionaire, you need housing that fits within your budget. And that's all we're doing. And the lower uh, compensation or income that you have, the fewer choices you have, because now you're spending 50, 60, 75% of your monthly income just to have a roof over your head it doesn't leave a lot of money left over for food, medicine, childcare, uh, a bus pass to get to work and things like that. It's, it's something I heard you say is interesting. So the city council person in the district in Churchill did not vote for it. But Jackson Ward. It's going to be in Jackson Ward, but you got a majority vote. I think what I find interesting about that is so like it to me, you clearly have great support from your board. Because were there any conversations or concerns about the fact that the city council person in the district wasn't supportive? And when you think about some of the hurdles and challenges that you know you will have to overcome because it's just mm -hmm. community stuff. Yeah. Like, 
those conversations? I, I'm, obviously, you had the support from your board and, and the rest of the city council, but what was that like? Because I've had similar experiences that um, even if there was a majority vote with the city council person not being for it, I think that would have been a challenge just for how we would have navigated in, in trying to work in that community. Well, two things that I would say to that. One um, is I have a great board and I have a wonderful working relationship with them where we share full transparency. So they are aware of everything that the team is doing. So I don't want them to get a phone call or pick up the paper or see something online and be surprised. Mm -hmm. So so they're always aware of, of, of the activities that we're pursuing. The other piece is that we have transformed our business model so that we don't, um, we're self-generating about 90% of our budget. And that is uh, very intentional. And we're trying to get to 100%. I don't know if we'll ever get there. But through our lines of business, within our nonprofit structure, we generate revenue. And the reason for that is so that we can have independence to say what needs to be said, to be able to push policy changes that may or may not be popular um, and not fear retribution uh, from mm -hmm. funders, whether they be corporate or um, uh, a public in particular. And we don't have a lot of public sector money pulsing through our organizational veins, which is also good. Um, and whenever we are, uh, moving forward on an agenda item, we always do it with respect. So we, we aren't poking anybody, we aren't doing anything underhanded, we really try to lead with our values. Um, sometimes that's well received, sometimes it's not. But I, I'm not doing anything, <laughs> my, my sniff test on a, on a lot of things is would my mom be okay with what I'm doing? <laughs> How I'm conducting myself? Mm -hmm. And so if, I, if I'm, I'm not cursing anybody out, I'm not jumping up and down and screaming, I'm just trying to put the facts out there and, and educate people, compromise if needed, to be able to move some things forward, and it's gonna be what it's gonna be. But I think, I don't wanna put myself or our organization up on a pedestal, but we're doing the right thing. All we're trying to do is give modest income households the opportunity to live in a better quality housing with services so that they can thrive. And for people who are against that, I'm going to keep pushing against their beliefs yeah. because I think what we're trying to do uh, levels the playing field for opportunity access. And that's the way Richmond region and our state and our country uh, become more competitive and successful when everyone is participating and contributing to our community. Beautiful, if I'm correct, your portfolio of housing is around $200 million? About 250. Whoo, I'm just so, I love it, I love it. But that's not the most impressive thing. Tell me what is. We have $300 million in our pipeline right now of deals that we're working on. So the $20 million Jackson Ward deal is great, super excited about that, but there are many more developments that mm. we're working on. And you've, done, you've been a great steward of money for your organization and having a pretty good safety net as well. We've been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very generous community here in the RVA region. And uh, people have supported us for decades, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. I just want to brag. You know, I mean, I wanna, I'm going to brag for you. you can, you're modest, humble, and, you know sweet soul but i am so happy and proud of the development and, and that you are creating for the better housing coalition and for obviously the city of richmond and uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit more later because i know that you're a part of the more regional work between here and dc mm -hmm. as well but before i go there you know i'm doing my homework i'm like okay let me make sure i keep up with all the things that miss harris got going on so i pick up the newspaper and i'm like well damn yesterday <laughs> it's like man so you and um what's the gentleman's name robert blue bob blue, bob blue. so is that you guys put put together an article and it's about uh transportation um 
Is this going to be a regular thing between the two of you, or is this just a one time? Because I got the impression that this was just the first. Um, so I think there will be multiple op-eds um, throughout the DMV region, okay. the, the district, Maryland, and Virginia. And um, we, the Greater Washington Partnership, and I just joined the board. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. just joined the board, and I'm very honored to be there. It's really looking at this region and optimizing talent to develop and uh, retain and then attract talent for our region to be competitive, not with Charlotte or Austin, but with Shanghai and Mumbai um, in a global marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so we have lots of uh, assets as a, a region, um, including um, higher ed institutions throughout uh, that footprint. Uh, we have uh, lots of powerful uh, corporations that are major employers, um, and we have amazing people who live here. But as you well know, um, opportunity access is not always equally yoked. And so this group is really looking at how we really look at inclusion, uh, look at systems level work of inclusion, transportation, um, education, and really trying to develop and, and hold on to a talent base that will let our corporations and employment and economic growth really uh, shine and compete with uh, world um, you know, regions uh, uh, across the globe. And so if you happen to Google Greater Washington Partnership, talk about being humbled, being asked to be on that board. Um, the CEO of Under Armour is on that. Mm. The chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase is on it. The CEO of Deloitte, the managing partner of McKinsey, uh, the co-founder of AOL. I mean, it's, it's wow. like a who's who. And I came on this year with um, the president of the Annie Casey Foundation. And again, I'm not name dropping. I haven't met any of these people. And, and mm -hmm. Bob Blue is on there. Mm -hmm. um, Tom Barkin, the president of the Richmond Fed, is on it. And so it's, it's folks who are pulling up because, you know, I, most of my day, I'm, I'm buried in the day-to-day -day of making sure Better Housing Coalition is making good decisions and, and, and we're firing on all cylinders. This is pulling up at the 100,000-foot level yeah. and looking across the landscape to say, what can we do better together? And I think this group in particular is saying that um, while there's a critical role for government because they set policy and policy can have cascading impacts across lots and lots of people but there's a role for corporations to play the, the the shortcoming on the public sector side is that we have election cycles so they're either two years or four years and and the types of systemic issues that we're looking at are sometimes decades long and so corporations have more of a long-term view. Um, and so it really doesn't matter who's sitting in what seat because we have leadership uh, that will work with whoever is elected um, in a particular seat. And we're saying that a regional transportation system, I, I would like to be able to go to Main Street Station and be in Union Station in DC in an hour. That's possible. It's probably a decade or more away but it's possible to do that. And what does that do for um, economic mobility for some of our folks where there are growing jobs in DC and people can live here where it's more affordable and, and have a reasonable commute back and forth? It's I would love that. Things. I would love that. You know, it's interesting. When I've explored the job market, mm -hmm. I've been presented with opportunities in DC that would be dream jobs. Yeah. But I, it's just too far, you know. It's yeah. just too, it's, it's just too far from the standpoint of, you know, I need to be there for my son in the evenings and yeah. things like that. And uh, 
if transportation got to that level, oh my gosh, that'd be amazing. Yeah. That'd be amazing. And we aren't going to even talk about flying cars and, yeah. and uh, autonomous vehicles but, and stuff because they're coming too. But that board that you, <laughs> that board, I mean, yeah, it has to be humbling to be on a board like that. Yep. And, I, and I'm glad that you, I know that you were not doing it to name drop, but I'm glad that you did mm -hmm. highlight those names yep. because I want my listeners to know the, the, the association that our Richmond leader, Miss Greta Harris, has. I mean, that is such an accomplishment. And I, and I think that helps, that helps listeners kind of understand the value and the work that you do in housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking about AOL and all these other things, but it's just good to see that someone that's a leader in the housing community on behalf of this region is at that table as well. Well, and I think, again, whatever table that anyone is sitting at, you bring your lived experience mm -hmm. here. And so, Again, I have my mama sitting on my shoulder here just telling me to be humble and to be um, honest and to be respectful as I'm sharing mm -hmm. these. But we had a Greater Washington Partnership breakfast meeting mm -hmm. this morning. And uh, as we were talking about some pretty heady things, you know, we, we have to talk about race mm -hmm. and the history of this country. So. So as we're thinking about these big global things, what we don't want to do is is make it so theoretical that we forget that ultimately it comes down to people and opportunity access. Yeah, just curious, Markel and this greater, they, they send you big checks on these boards? There is compensation. Got to try, get, try to get in your they, pockets they, a little bit. It comes <laughs> from serving on a corporate board. It's yeah. different from serving yeah. on a nonprofit board or university board. Mm -hmm. um, you just gotta get in your pockets a little bit just to see. It's uh, it's helpful. <laughs> it's helpful. She's For been, my retirement. Listen, she is she is media trained. Okay. <laughs> she is not gonna catch any bait. Some people catch the bait, you know. You've probably seen it. <laughs> All of that is public knowledge. Yeah. So it's a publicly traded company, so if people get on the internet, they can find that out. That's good. That's, that's what makes it fun. Though. That was great. That was great. So um, I want to segue into talking about the, the merger that's happening. But before I go there, just back on transportation, and I, again, I loosely looked at the article. I didn't get a chance to dive in it deep. Yeah. But something that came to my mind in looking at an article, I said, you can't talk about housing without talking about jobs, I don't feel like. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't talk about jobs without talking about transportation. Yeah. And when you look at the city of Richmond in our, in our current transportation system, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> something in an article, I don't know if it was specifically wrote out or if it's just something that I walked, the impression I got was that you can get around, the, the time that you can get from point A to point B in a car versus public transportation. Is minutes versus an hour or yeah. something like that. I think the example was if someone lived in one of our properties in the van and they worked for Dominion out in Innsbruck, yeah. it would take over an hour yeah. with a transfer to get there and it's less than a 15 minute drive if you had a car, but not everyone has a car. And from a climate change perspective, not everyone needs a car. Yeah. If you had a public transportation system that was thoughtful and robust. And basically with the infrastructure bill that was passed um, recently, there will be resources and what we're encouraging, encouraging our local and state leaders to do is the pulse, which mm -hmm. is cool. It's, it's, yeah. it's a big step forward yeah. for Richmond. But that's the first of a dozen different yeah. legs of the pulse. And yeah. so this was saying, let's go, uh, the, the existing one is what, east-west, now let's go north-south. Yeah. And then let's start filling it in so that you know, I think I'll be dead and gone, but once it's fully um, uh, implemented, it'll look like New York City subway system. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter where you live, there's a reasonable transportation solution that can get you from point yeah. A to point B at, that won't take forever and it won't cost an arm and a leg to get there. Yeah. The other strategy um, is um, to not have segregated neighborhoods, either racially or so socioeconomically. Yeah. And then to, to have modest income people, like we, we tried unsuccessfully to get a parcel of land in Innsbruck once they changed the zoning. And there are like 4,000 
market rate apartments now in Innsbruck mm -hmm. that used to be a sort of a sleepy uh, office park area. Mm -hmm. And all of the retail that's around Innsbruck, the restaurants, the short pump mall that's right up uh, Broad Street, folks are living in Powhatan, Louisa, uh, down in Petersburg and commuting because they can't afford to live in communities like that. Yeah. Uh, we talk, you know, or wringing our hands about the public education system, and it, it is a challenge. We want to pour knowledge into our kids. Uh, that, that's important for our future as a society, and yet we're failing our kids on so many different levels with the public education system. Well, what if we had a regional public education system? What if uh, kids who were, uh, you know, living in Gilpin Court could go out to one of the elementary schools in Short Pump mm -hmm. that are one of the best rated schools in the country. Mm -hmm. What would that do for the, the, the vision of that child? You know, because so, so many of our kids, their, their world is like a few blocks around where they yeah. call home. And, and to just open up their uh, perspective to the whole global community yeah. out there. And one of the things that the Greater Washington Partnership is talking about, the jobs of today and in the future are tech jobs, whether it's cybersecurity, whether it's AI, you know, we aren't, the job market, a lot of the jobs that people are doing today won't be around uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So we need to be training our kids at the elementary school level, middle school level, high school level, and then on to post-secondary education around introducing them to these technologies. They, they may be foreign at the beginning, but they have the intellect to be able to do this work and, and it's gonna be needed in well into the future. So. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> you, got, you gave me some, uh, we're gonna have some really good clips from, from, from this one. From this interview. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, and, and I think the other thing, Randy, is that all of this, like you said, is interconnected. You can't talk about housing yeah. without talking about health. Yeah. Because if you don't have good health, then you, you won't be able to work yeah. and have money to yeah. pay for housing. Um, you won't be, uh, education is important. I mean, it's all yeah. interconnected, and I'm biased, I know this. But I believe if you don't know where you're going to lay your head at night, then it's almost impossible to address health, education, economic mobility, employment issues. Yeah, and I like the fact how you brought you the example with children in schools because yeah. you can't. I mean, they are our future. Absolutely. And they should have the opportunity, regardless of where they live, to receive the best public or private education of their choice. So. Um, you um so i wanted to talk about the merger but before we go there i don't want to go there yet because you you, you made me think, think about something um he was talking about i don't know if you i know that you were is, are you still the chair of the virginia redistricting commission or is that I am. you are yeah. um probably the most controversial question i'll ask mm -hmm. okay because i think in october that you guys were having a meeting and made public news that you and I think and a couple of your colleagues walked out the meeting. And it appeared that, I mean, the impression I took from it was that <coughs> it, didn't, it didn't seem like anyone was trying to have a, a real conversation about the real issues. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, and where we are now? Because now they're already in session. I think you guys were trying to prepare some things for session, if I'm correct as it pertains to this, the redrawing of the lines. And Can you bring us in on that? Uh, I, don't know. I don't know what that does. I've seen a, I've seen a, I've seen a, I've seen a, a change there with your app there. Tell me about this, because I know that was a tense, stressful situation. Mm -hmm. So um, I am still a co-chair of the Virginia Redistricting Commission, which is a new commission um, that was constitutionally created a year or so ago. And I will remain co-chair of the commission for 10 years. I didn't know that. Wow. I signed up Gosh. For it. Um, and the only way you, um, I give that up is if I resign or when um, I am replaced and the commissioners are only replaced 
um, every 10 years at the point that the census comes out. Okay. How do, that, how, how do you become this? First off, how do you get into a how do you get into a 10 year sentence? <laughs> this is a sentence. <laughs> 10 years is a long time to serve in a role. Yep. So I have, um, you know, I have my little girl tribe that I hang out here mm -hmm. in Richmond with, and we're we've been friends for decades, and now most of us are in really powerful positions yeah. around the region, and we we're always you know, talking and educating each other around how do we make our community better. And so at the end of 2020, you know, the, 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 the vote in November of that year was that we did a constitutional amendment to create a, a, a new commission to draw um, uh, lines, political lines. And so, uh, at the time, there was an article in the paper that said it was a lot of older, white, wealthy men who had put their anybody could apply to be on the commission, and so they were. The, the The article was like encouraging people to apply so that it would be more representative of, of the makeup of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and so we ended up having a Zoom call, the girls. And they said, somebody needs to throw their hat in the ring. And, and the deadline was like two days away. And somehow I didn't step back far fast enough. <laughs> and, and they said, it, they rallied around me, Greta, you ought to do it. And I said, okay. I said, I, my mom had just passed away and my sisters and I were going to Danville to clean out the house. And I said, I'm gonna be gone all day tomorrow and, and the next day. And they said, well, let's look at it. We pulled up on Zoom, you know, what the application looked like. Um, and so they said, you can take a computer with you while you're driving back and forth to Danville. We'll get the letters of recommendation and then you submit on Friday by midnight. Mm -hmm. Long story short, um, got back to Richmond, finished the application. They got the letters of recommendation and I submitted it. Uh, 11 45 p.m. that night we found out that over 1200 people applied for the 16 person commission and I was saying shoo 1200 people I don't have to worry about it you know mm -hmm. I, we did it and we can say we tried but you know I'm not worried that I will get chosen and then um, the the heads of both the Democratic House and Senate and the Republican House and Senate had to whittle it down to the top 16 people. Um, and I made the cut, which surprised me uh, because uh, at the time, Speaker uh, Philip Corn, uh, Corn, yeah, Philip Corn, um, uh, chose me and I've never met her, but I made the cut. And then those names were given to retired judges who then whittled it down to the 16 people. And um, I made it. And then at our first meeting in early 2021, um, somehow I ended up getting chosen as co-chair. So again, it's just a lot of serendipitous things, I think, uh, that ended up there. The reason that I took a breath when you brought this up is that because I am still co-chair, I can't talk about the work of the commission, but so much. Um, and, um, but what I would say is that it is not just a piece of legislation, it's a constitutional amendment that, in my opinion, needs to be changed again, which would have to be a referendum and citizens would have to vote for it. I think structurally there were some flaws in the way we were put together, having an equal number of Republicans and Democrats, we couldn't break um, uh, ties when there were issues. I think there probably should be some changes that say that we have to have one map drawer, one set of uh, lawyers. Um, and honestly, I would say that we probably shouldn't have elected officials on the commission going forward. Mm -hmm. um, but that was probably one of the most difficult experiences that I've ever had because it was a real honor to be in that leadership role because the, the, the basic fundamental rights of, by which America was founded 
and has never fully executed upon is the right to vote. And, and by voting, you get to say who you want your representative to be uh, to, in order to do policy uh, changes that will make your life better in some form or fashion. And there, there has been a history of manipulating where lines go so that whoever's in power stays in power. And one of the things that facilitated the walkout was that we were talking about Voting Rights Act and, and going through the redistricting that is not unique to Virginia. Every mm -hmm. state and, and locality has to do it periodically. Um, was that um, it, it's an impossible rubrics cube because you have to, there are constitutional things you have to have, you take the number, the, the population number and divide it by the number of districts. So it has to be relatively the same population size for new districts. You have to look at um, communities of interest. You have to look at the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. um, and because the changing demographics, almost every place in Virginia grew, except for Southside and Southwestern Virginia. Most of the growth is in Northern Virginia, mm -hmm. Central and Hampton Roads in the Urban Crescent. Um, and most of that growth were uh, populations of color. And so my argument and that of a couple of my colleagues, uh, citizen colleagues on the commission, was that we ought to have more um, minority majority or minority coalition districts um, that reflect the changing demographics of Virginia. And other commissioners were not in agreement with that and weren't willing to compromise and we wanted to get their attention. So mm -hmm. we walked out, but we came back. Gotcha, yeah. okay. Thank it, you for sharing it's, that. Bo it's book worthy. That experience it is, is book worthy. Sounds I, like just, it. I can't talk fully about it. Sounds like it. W will, right you, will you write a book one day? Uh, I have no idea. I don't know. Don't have time for that right now. Yeah. But um, maybe I mean, a lot of cool experiences I've yeah. had. I feel very blessed. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, I mean, do you see yourself ever not working? I don't. Yeah, I don't. I imagine. have some friends who've retired and they're playing golf and doing things that they enjoy. I, I, what I would like to do is be a little bit more balanced. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly try to encourage that to my, my um, colleagues who work with me to have work-life balance. I am not a good example of that. <laughs> Um, but I, I think if I could just travel a bit more yeah. internationally when it's safe to do that, I love what I do. So yeah. it doesn't yeah. feel like work all yeah. the time. And I think I need to get better at saying no, because right now I feel a little stretched and oversubscribed. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, all the things that I'm involved in are cool. Yeah. And, and I think with a little bit of luck and a lot of work, they can make people's lives better. So. Well, you're stretching, you have stretched, um, you're stretching the Better Housing Coalition right now. You and the Virginia Supportive Housing have yeah. went through a, a good year, I guess, of due diligence and boards have came together and decided to merge. And now, if I'm understanding, that's, you, you, you are merging, but you're still going through another year, if I understand correctly, of uh, integration. integration. Yeah. And uh, what's that like right now? Intense. <laughs> It's intense, but it's good. And um, in the housing arena, and I honestly, I believe in other um, nonprofit industries too, scale matters. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for us, um, they work on one end of the housing spectrum and we work on a different one. They work with um, <clears throat> highly vulnerable and high need individuals uh, mm -hmm. that they go look for folks under bridges mm -hmm. and in the forest yeah. and in people's cars and, and help people for a whole host of reasons that don't have a home. And we work with the working poor um, and, um, and, and then modest income households. And by coming together, we can address homelessness to home ownership all under one roof with a footprint that goes along the I-64 corridor from Hampton Roads, Central Virginia, uh, up towards Charlottesville. And really, while we do real estate development, that's not the 
the magic comes from the services. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have quality shelter. It's not luxurious shelter, but quality shelter that's safe, clean, um, and we try to have it be inspiring where people live. And then we have services that help people to thrive. So they help our seniors to age in place with dignity, um, to help our working adults uh, through career navigation paths and really help them get to career ladder, um, uh, living wage employment, and then to help our kids just have a bigger viewpoint on the world. Uh, we have a scholarship program and all this kind of stuff. So when all is said and done, when we kiss and become one organization about a year from now, <laughs> I like that. Uh, we'll be about a $40 million Ooh, operation beautiful. with 220-ish employees. Um, and part of the integration, why we're taking our time here, is that we have uh, 54 entities, LLCs and LLPs, mm. that all have to be brought in under the new umbrella, so we have to talk to HUD and to the state and to our investors and our lenders. We have 167 bank accounts that all have to be integrated into one system. Uh, we have culture work that we're gonna be doing between the two teams. Uh, we have, um, they have about 16 members on their board. We have 16 members and we aren't asking anyone to step off. So now we have a 30 plus member board, wow. that's a lot. And so we'll be doing board work um, next week we're announcing our new senior leadership team so some difficult but necessary decisions had to be made around leadership of the joint departments um, and we're gonna have fun and at the meantime we have together almost 400 million dollars mm -hmm. development that we're trying to move forward in a very uh, volatile uh, real estate development you are a phenomenal guest though you really are because you as a podcaster, when having conversation with a person, you got a big conversation, which only those who are deeply engaged listen to the big, but people love the sound bites. They love the pieces. You gave me so many gems today okay. that can be used in a variety of ways. Um, so I hope that you come back and I hope that you, I think that there needs to be a podcast within your organization. Mm. I mean, as a resource for the community and just providing education in regard to housing. That's, and That's a cool idea. We, yeah. can, we, can, we got folks who can help you with that. Yeah. So, I mean, I just think that, but there's no, there, fill the gap. There's no one doing it. That is true. And, and honestly, we have a senior uh, leadership retreat next week. And so that can be one of the ideas that I bring to them. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I think my team is a little exhausted yeah. from the last couple of years, but uh, we're throwing everything up in the air. Throw it up there. We're building something new. Yeah. So add that to the list. Great. Yeah. I could ask you a thousand more questions, but I can't because I know your time is sh short today. And so we appreciate you coming on. But before before you go, last mm -hmm. question. Okay. Tell the folks out there who may not be familiar with the Randy Wilson podcast why you think they may should tap in and, and listen to an episode. Well, this is only my second podcast that I've ever done. And um, I took the time when you and I have become mm -hmm. friends over the last year, and I looked at some of your podcasts, mm -hmm. and I like your curiosity mm -hmm. and, and your care of the community. And um, so I trust you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, you have some interesting guests that have come on. Mm -hmm. I hope that I people will think that I'm one of those. Oh, yeah. And... Um, and so I think it's just information, and, and sometimes I think you're bringing in guests that people don't normally see. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so it's nice to pause for a little bit and, mm -hmm. and have an in-depth conversation, and you aren't just doing 15-second you know, commercials here and there. Yeah. You get to know people a little bit more, yeah. and I think, I think it goes back to the care and curiosity which I think I see as a, a really great attribute. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. This is the Randy Wilson podcast being brought to you guys from Spin 100 FM, uh, a podcast for the culture, from the culture. And uh, we're really happy to have Miss Greta Harris as our 97th episode. She'll be back. She will be back. And uh, we definitely really look forward to having you back as a staple on our show. You can come back anytime. Hey, give me a good number. 
right? I, I'm not going to hit 100. I, I get that. But <laughs> give, give me a good, good solid number here. Well, right? hey, 97 was a very big year for the Chicago Bulls, <laughs> okay? okay? So right, that's true, too. The, the, 90s were, the 90s were some good years, okay? But uh, thank you for being on the show. All right, thank you.